You know, I don't understand this podcasting thing. How come you boys can't have those keg parties and chase the girls like all the other nice boys do? Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's The Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I think we should all be millionaires, don't you? Well, come along and meet today's guest, the seven-figure coach who's going to help you make fewer broke-ass decisions, Rachel Rogers. Plus, that rental car costs how much? During today's headlines, we'll help you avoid a surprise during your next trip. And later, we'll even toss out the Haven Lifeline to a guy who wonders how he should handle a windfall of cash from his self-employment income. And after that, well, I'll steal the show with my trivia. What else is new? And now, two guys who are definitely not millionaires, it's Joe and O J J J J G. That's because we're trillionaires. It's with a T. Bajillionaire. Yeah, who cares about being a million? We'll let Rachel Rogers today deal with millionaires, the little people as we call them. We'll 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 take on just getting started. (laughs) We're gonna blow past the billionaire level. Hey everybody, welcome to Lots of Moolah for the Win podcast. I'm Joe Saul Hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter, and welcome to Wednesday. Uh, Let me be the first to welcome you officially to Wednesday this week. We're so glad you're here with us and across the card table from me, ready to help you fight a better second half of your week. It's Mr. OG. It's just profound to think about like the difference between a million and a billion, actually. It's like, hey, I got to I got to a million. Cool. Now do that a thousand more times. You know what gives me hope is have you seen the chart on Warren Buffett's wealth and yeah. how oh, yeah. most of it is I use this info all the time. He made most of that well after he was my age. So I'm good. I'm going to start yeah. in like five years because Buffett's already proved. Well, that- he did start like in five years from now, when you're his age of when he started, he was at 70 million. So oh, he was. Yeah. But you see how he climbed after that? Yeah. You're like, I don't need to get to a hundred billion. One billion will be fine. I know. If I start at 70 bucks. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that, that gets me there. Rachel Rogers on today's show. I have seen her on uh, Drew Barrymore show. I've seen her on, well, I've seen her all over. But today, we're going to ask her some questions that I didn't see them ask her. Bum, bum. Rachel Rogers, waiting in the wings, talking about us all becoming millionaires. Let's get into our headlines. Hello, darlings. And now, it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. First headline comes to us from Yahoo Money, written by Stephanie Asimkis. Car rental shortages frustrate lockdown-wary travelers. Uh, Stephanie writes, Americans planning post-vacation trips may be forced to pay eye-watering car rental prices if they can secure a vehicle at all as lockdown-wary travelers flood the roads. Major cities selling out of cars for entire weekends, according to data from Autoslash, an online discount car rental booking platform. Or remaining inventory is going for $400 to $500 per day in Hawaii, three fifteen dollars a day in Tampa, $200 in Phoenix and Tucson, and $223 in Charleston, South Carolina. In some regions, car rental price is 300% higher compared with pre-pandemic levels. This gets down to the thing you and I were talking about last week about how, man, if you're booking a trip right now, so is everybody else. Mm-hmm. And I know that the trip might not go off. It might might not go off, especially if it's an international travel. But man, I would I would book that trip now, OG. Have you ever had the experience where you've gone to get your rental car and they go, yeah, it's not here? Almost. Uh, when we went to the Virgin Islands, it was shortly, and by shortly, I mean about four months after a hurricane had come right. through. Okay. And uh, it had decimated, it had hit right behind the airport where the rental lot was. So they had only about half the fleet. When we got there, there was, there were maybe two people in front of us, but they were informed in front of us that they may or may not get a car. And I found out here actually in Texarkana talking to the local people, people apparently rent cars all the time and don't return them. 
or just don't return them on time. Return them four days later, like it's a library book or something. Yeah, that does blow my mind because I kind of feel like the same way. And it has happened to us before. But you go, where, where are the cars that were supposed to be here? I mean, you know, Bill rented it on Tuesday and said he'd be back Thursday. It's That's what, now Friday. The Where's woman Bill's in, car? The woman in the Virgin Islands showed us there were like 12 cars outstanding that they were waiting on at first. And, and by that, and she's like, and in an hour, there's supposed to be another seven that still haven't been returned yet. So a flight comes in behind us. And now there's a line a mile long behind me. And we've already been waiting for an hour. And finally, somebody, oh finally, somebody gets a car. And then the people in front of us, they finally get a car about an hour and a half, maybe an hour and 45 minutes in. So we're waiting. And the woman says, uh, sir, I know you wanted a Da, 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 whatever, you know, four wheel drive Jeep. And we were going to take it across to St. John's from St. Thomas. And I said, I'll take whatever you got. And she, and she laughed and she, and she said, that's what I do too at this point. Cause everybody's given her hell and we weren't, cause it wasn't her fault that they right. didn't have cars and people are just bashing her, which was stupid. But anyway, this is, this is how bad it was when about 15 or 20 minutes after that conversation, we got a car. Everybody in line cheered for us. Like everybody in line. And it, She's like, how good are you on motorcycles? <laughs> the car that we got, the car that we got, the back fender looked like it was going to fall off at any point. It was, you know, that thing where you go walk around it and you check for all the scratches and stuff. Right. None of that. Cause the whole thing was dented like the whole car. And it was and just it, like her car. <laughs> she was just like, just Hey, take why mine. don't you use mine? And. You're going to bring it back, right? And if you don't, you're not going anywhere. You're on, you're on an island. It's a 92 Honda. Uh, I, I it's a Seinfeld episode about the, are you going to need the insurance? Oh, yes. I'm going to need the extra insurance on this one. <laughs> I, I need lots of insurance. But every time I went up hills, first of all, all the red lights were on. The check engine light, you know, oh, the boy. air pressure light, like all those. Every time I went up a hill, and if you've been to St. Thomas, it's very, very, very hilly. And uh, some very steep roads. And also some hella potholes. There were a couple of times I hit a pothole where I was sure my tire was going to go down and it didn't. But there were also times when I was motoring up a hill and I didn't think we were going to make it. In fact, our whole family was joking. I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. As the car is slowing, I'm pressed on the gas as far as it'll go. And uh, the car's slowing down as I'm going oh up the hill. Yeah. And this also brings up something else too. Besides booking that vacation, it also brings up that pre-planning any trips you're doing now, like pre-planning, things aren't the way they were a year ago, OG. Nothing. Well, remember a year ago when Hertz was shutting down all of their operations and they were selling all of their fleet, basically? Uh, yeah, that's kind of why there's not a lot of cars, because they sold them all. Have you tried been car shopping lately? There's no used cars either. There's just... Everybody has so much money right now, like with all the savings from not going anywhere and all the savings from I was talking to a client who usually fills up her car three times a week with gas and obviously hasn't in 14 months it's just like yeah I don't all that money's just piled up you know yeah it feels bad you either you either lost your job and really struggled the last year or you were cash flow positive by a lot yeah it was definitely one end or the other. And the and you can see it just in the buying decisions. In February, I saw a stat that 14% of mortgages were for second homes. Highest number ever. And it's trickling down to vehicles. Well, look at on the other side. Speaking of second homes, look at lumber costs. Yeah. Remodel costs. Yep. The art market. Yeah, I don't really pay attention to that, but... All that stuff. Okay, okay, Mr. Foo Foo. Hey, hey. Yeah, the lumber market is crazy. You probably know that. The, the car market is the crazy. Wine but market. Have you have you noticed the price of Van Gogh? It's astronomical. I tried to offload my Picasso and I was well rewarded. Speaking of rental cars, you know the Van Gogh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm here all week. So I think make a reservation. You know, don't wait till the week of. If you're thinking about your car, which does remind me that we're we have a trip scheduled and and we'll likely need a rental car, but we have a backup if we can't get one. Steal the neighbor's cars—that's your backup. Yeah, actually, just Ubering. 
Well, what about making rental? Can you Uber our family. <laughs> yeah, we Uber need to go family. to Florida. <laughs> Sir, that'll be $11 million. Yeah, I oh, know. F- fine. That's it's good. cheaper than Hertz. <laughs> oh, but I wonder if you could make, should you make reservations at more than one place? Reserve two cars just in case. Yeah. Well, as long as there's no downside to get out of it, like, you know, I'm, I'm making some hotel reservations for the second half of this year right now for conferences, for FinCon, for podcast movement, right. but I'm looking very carefully at when I can get out and how soon, you know, in one case it was 72 hours and the other one, it was 48. So right. just make sure that you get out of one of those reservations on time. I don't think there's anything that's how the system works, right? Yeah, I don't know. Have plan B, I guess, if you're renting cars. And- well, and I, and I even think if it's that expensive, you know, you look at the depreciation of your car. We talked about this with people that are driving Uber and things. John was explaining that, uh, that because he has a very reliable, efficient car that he makes good money driving. I've gone on vacations before where I had a rental car just because I didn't, the, the wear and tear on my car didn't make sense versus the cheap cost of somebody else's car. Now that's completely different. Right. It may make better economic sense to take your own car. I've never rented a car to go on vacation. I've only rented a car at the, you know, like we fly to Florida, then you rent a car or you fly to Michigan yeah. and then you rent a car. We actually, when we were driving all over the summer, we, when we were staying in Palm Springs, drove to Texarkana where we were going to move, rented a car in Texarkana and used that car for the next month to drive all over the West. <laughs> rental car the whole time it's like of ours. unlimited mileage you're like yes sir yes. <laughs> i will need the extra insurance and in our second headline which comes to us from investment news and is written by jeff benjamin fund manager finds way around capital gains distributions i think a lot of people don't realize oh gee that even if you don't sell a mutual fund if you hold it and it's not in some kind of a tax shelter that you still can pay a tax sure. on what's inside of your fund. So explain to everybody how that works, and then I'll, I'll explain this piece to people. Well, mutual funds and ETFs are not taxable entities, so they don't pay taxes themselves. They pass on their taxes that are due to their shareholders. So if you have a fund that is buying and selling securities, or those securities pay dividends, then the profits from the sale or the, you know, the income from the dividends gets passed on to shareholders. So there's conceivably a time where you bought it five years ago and in 2020, the fund manager went, yeah, I'm going to sell this stock that's in there. You know, we, we had this huge run up in Apple, so we want to sell it. And even though you didn't sell anything, there were sales within the portfolio and you get a capital gain distribution or a dividend distribution. What's worse is if you've lost money in it and still get a capital gain distribution, which that happens on occasion too. I think the worst, worst thing is when you just put money in and you haven't done anything, there's no real fair way to do this. I've thought about 50 different ways they could do it. There really isn't one. So they just declare a date that they're going to disperse the taxes among the shareholders. But the worst thing that happens is you just bought in. And the fund just sold some highly appreciated stuff and you get this monster gain and you've made no money or worse yet, it goes down a little bit right after you bought it and you get this big capital gains tax. Yeah. I mean, they aggregate it. Usually funds do this toward the end of the year, although not everybody does it, but usually they aggregate it for the end of the year and then say, "Eh, here's our number, $15 a share. But that's important. It is public information. They do declare it ahead of time. Generally, the most dangerous time to put money into a non-IRA fund when it comes to this stuff is probably, what, late November, maybe the first week of December Yeah, uh, would be kind of the hot time to look out and see what the tax may be, the tax ramification, if you're putting a lot of money in. I think if your dollar cost averaging a little bit at a time, wouldn't worry yeah, about it. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, so funds, because of that, have capital gains distributions. Now, what's interesting is exchange-traded funds... <laughs> Do not explain that one to people, OG, because this is, to me, they're largely doing the same thing. They're just using a legal loophole to magically make the capital gain disappear. What's interesting about this piece is that exchange traded funds, in a lot of ways, the same thing, a diversified collection of assets, often stocks, 
diversified collection with a set thing that it follows. Usually it's an index that it follows and there can be trades for it to continue to model the index. They will not pay capital gains. And the reason is because of some, what I think of as legal loopholes, they're able to trade out shares instead of selling the shares. So an exchange traded fund, let's say that, uh, I don't know. General Motors is going out and Ford is going in. Why that would happen, I don't know, which is why I think I'll use that as an example. They could take the General Motors shares that are too many and just set them off to the side, hand them back to the broker, and they pick up the Ford shares. Didn't sell them. They swapped them. So they're allowed to swap shares instead of a buy-sell agreement just because it's an exchange-traded fund and not a mutual fund. Fair? I don't know if it is fair, but that's that's the way it works. So Huber Capital Management in this piece is a company borrowing a page from exchange traded fund industry to protect mutual fund investors from taxes. Jeff writes as an investor in the mutual fund he manages, Joe Huber will do whatever it takes to avoid those pesky capital gains distributions that can blindside and frustrate long term investors. The founder and chief executive of Huber Capital Management applies four basic tax management strategies and then goes to the next level with a fifth technique that's enabled the $400 million fund shop to avoid paying out, quote, material capital gains distributions over its entire 14-year history. Quote, I say we never paid out any material capital gains because one year we had less than a penny in capital gains distributions, Huber says. Most of Huber's tax management strategy resembles the approach taken by other tax-conscious portfolio managers. One, he pays close attention to opportunities for tax loss harvesting. Talk about how that works, OG, because this is something that our friends can do. Sure. So tax loss harvesting is a uh, time, and this happened a few times last year, where let's say that you buy using your GM or Ford shares, as an example, you buy your GM stock or an ETF or a mutual fund, and it goes down in value. Well, you can trade that away. So you can sell that and then go buy something that's similar to it, not the same thing, because we talked about wash sales before. Wash sales when you buy the same thing over again. But you buy something that's slightly different, but kind of sort of the same. And then you get to bank that loss. You get to capitalize that loss. And you've got this, basically an IOU from the government at that point that now you can use to offset all of your future gains against that that loss. He also holds on to investments for a long time to avoid short-term taxes, holds them for at least a year, which folds into his long-term investing approach. We can all do that. And when he wants to reduce the weighting of a security, meaning he wants to sell some of it, trim it down, he'll use inflows to dilute that weighting instead of triggering a taxable event. So in other words, if your asset allocation is skewed, let's say you have to have 35% of your money in large company stocks and you're only at 25, he will then with new money, flow that toward the area where he's weak instead of moving money around and triggering taxes. The, those things all make sense for the average person. They can do the same thing. Right. Yeah. There's a lot of ways to help rebalance your portfolio without selling it. You can add new cash. You can use dividends to rebalance it or the tax loss harvesting type idea that yeah. that you can find some opportunities for for rebalancing that also benefit you from a tax standpoint. Get this one though. While mutual funds almost always honor fund redemptions with cash, they can also provide investors with actual securities from the fund. And this is what ETFs are allowed to do. So in other words, if you decide that you want out, instead of OG giving you cash and selling and that loss or gain gets spread among everybody, they'll just give you the GM stock. So listen to this. Huber explains We have from time to time negotiated with non-taxable clients to move money into separate accounts, meaning accounts that are managed specifically just for them. Instead of being in a mutual fund, these people have Huber manage money for them separately on the side. And we deliver them securities because these shares are going into qualified accounts. We get to decide which tax lots we deliver to them. Meaning, if he has highly appreciated securities in a non-IRA fund and somebody has an IRA that's investing in his fund, 
he can take those shares, move it over to the separate account that's inside the IRA, then sell it when it gets there, avoids the tax for everybody in the fund. Right. Yep. Is that the kind of thing the average person can do? Like, could I move, if I've got highly appreciated shares, can I take those shares and move them into my IRA and then sell them inside my IRA? Uh, I don't think I, so. I, I mean, I remember specifically trying to do this for a client like 15 years ago. So it's been a long time, but none of the brokered services that this client worked with would do it. And I couldn't find one that would do it. Yeah. That's not to say that there's not somebody out there who may, but, but remember, you're also talking about when you're thinking about like trying to move money from your brokerage account to your qualified accounts, at most you're doing six or $7,000. Yeah. Right. You know, so the likelihood of that all being gain is pretty low. So the effectiveness is probably pretty low also. But the idea of separate accounts, which is kind of a a different idea, taking a mutual fund or taking an ETF that normally you'd have 10 shares of the ETF, let's say, or 10 shares of the mutual fund. And instead, you've got this portfolio of 100 different securities that seems overwhelming for probably most people, but that's effectively what you what you have when you have an ETF or a mutual fund. We have done that in the past or seen that with clients where that provides additional flexibility for that taxes or for those taxes for those clients. There are trust strategies where you can do this, right? You can take highly appreciated stocks and move them into a move them into a trust and then sell them. And I'm thinking about some of the charitable trust out there where we could sell them then and uh, also still take money for our lifetime out of the trust. And then the remainder goes to a charity. Yeah. And that, I mean, now you're really talking about some pretty advanced heavy uh, duty stuff, heavy advanced estate planning. But but you're talking about donating appreciated shares to charity. This is a great strategy now, too, especially with donor advised funds, with donor advised funds. Let's say that you've got, you know, you normally put $5,000 a year in the church envelope and your Apple stock is appreciated $5,000, well, just donate the shares to the church. Boom. Now you don't pay taxes on the gain and they still get the money. You know, it's a win-win or put it in a donor advised fund and then distribute it out. Yeah. Lots of interesting strategies with, uh, with tax management. And I thought this was a good way to look at it. By the way, if you get our guide to the shows, stackingbenjamins.com forward slash stacker. You've already seen this and we have some other resources in there to help you with your taxes. But we also, of course, have it in the show notes. If you want to take a look, stackingbenjamins.com is where you will find them. In just a second, OG and I are going to have our takeaways from today's headlines. But first, if you're a business owner, you don't need us to tell you that running a business is tough. You have to be, especially for us, I have to be on one hand creative, on another hand analytical, and to make sure that we bring some good financial tips. But then third, you have to manage people, right? You're an HR function as well. And all of those things are tough enough, but you might be making it harder on yourself than necessary. Don't let a bunch of different tools, like if you've got just QuickBooks, spreadsheets, don't let all this mess slow you down anymore. Time to upgrade to NetSuite. Stop paying for multiple systems that don't give you the information you need when you need it. Ditch the spreadsheets and all those old software programs you've outgrown. Now's the time to upgrade to NetSuite by Oracle, the world's number one cloud business system. NetSuite gives you visibility and control over your financials, HR, inventory, e-commerce, and more. Everything you need, all in one place, instantaneously. Whether you're doing a million or a hundreds of million in revenue, save time and money with NetSuite. Join over 21,000 companies using NetSuite right now. Let NetSuite show you how they'll benefit your business with a free product tour. Head to netsuite.com slash stacker and they'll walk you through it, how you can get rid of that mess, that jumble and turn it into something beautiful. Schedule your free product tour right now at netsuite.com slash stacker, netsuite.com slash stacker. So I think my first takeaway, OG, is uh, make the make the reservation early because you can't be sure if the car rental agency understands what it takes to actually <laughs> reserve a car. 
Name, please. Uh, Seinfeld, uh, you made a reservation for a midsize, and she's a small. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. We have no midsize available at the moment. I don't understand. I made a reservation. Do you have my reservation? Oh, yes, we do. Unfortunately, we ran out of cars. But the reservation keeps the car here. That's why you have the reservations. I know why we have reservations. I don't think you do. <laughs> if you did, I'd have a car. <laughs> See, you know how to take the reservation. You just don't know how to hold the reservation. And that's really the most important part of the reservation, the holding. Little difference between the two. Yeah. I don't think it's fair that you get Seinfeld to help you with your takeaway. <laughs> and yours? Well, it's not going to be anywhere near as good as that, I suppose. A Jerry in mine? I, I think you have to recognize that taxes really matter. You know, taxes matter when it comes to investing and it matters today and it matters in the future. So pay attention to it. Rachel Rogers is the founder of a company called Hello7, a multi-million dollar company teaching women how to earn more money and build wealth. She's been featured all over the place, as I mentioned in our open today, Time, Forbes, Entrepreneur, Fast Company, Washington Post, NBC News, Cosmopolitan. I've seen her on the morning shows lately. Of course, the biggest moment of her life, of course, coming up, being on the Stacking Benjamin show. I'm sure that's what she's telling all her friends about. I finally made it. I finally arrived. She's an inspiration for so many people and that my favorite things that she talks about, we're going to dive into today, setting boundaries, setting your goals much higher than they were in the past. And, and I can't wait to talk to you about this afterwards, OG upgrading your lifestyle. What's that all about? Well, let's talk to her. Rachel Rogers coming down to the basement. And here she comes down the stairs to the basement. My new friend, Rachel Rogers is here. How are you? I'm awesome. I'm excited to be here. Well, we're excited to have you and I'll tell you why. Number one, I love the book, but number two was, I just saw you a couple weeks ago on Drew Barrymore, which I'm sure by the way, Rachel was the second biggest point in your career behind being in my mom's basement here. For sure. Absolutely. I, yes. That is correct. You, you lie very well. That was very, <laughs> sounded very, very sincere. But they were talking about six figure mindset and you come on and you immediately say, that's not high enough. We shouldn't be thinking six figure mindset. We should be thinking way, way bigger than that. What's, yes. why? Well, because I mean, there are all kinds of studies that show that the average family who lives off of six figures, low six figures. That used to be the thing that we all shot for. But studies show now that it's it's not enough to live off of because of the cost of housing, the cost of childcare. The average family that is living off $100,000 has $2,000 annually mm. of disposable income. You have one car breakdown and that money is gone, right? So it's so tight. It's not enough. And we shouldn't just make enough to be comfortable for ourselves. We can make more and have a bigger impact on the world and using our money to create foundations, donate to charity, donate to political campaigns, and also just create other things in the world, create opportunities for other people. So I think we should be shooting for seven figures. And I think it's so doable. We don't really recognize how much earning potential we have. You spend time talking about how a none of us get the million dollar lifestyle because we're mired in me mediocrity. We don't set our sights high enough, but women much more than men. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Well, it's because how we're socialized, right? Like girls are socialized, you know, from birth still to this day in a lot of households to be thinking about being caretakers. And there's nothing wrong with being a caretaker, but it's just like, why is that? It's the assumption that women are going to have the more domestic role in their families. And women, of course, now work full time. So we're working and doing all of the household chores. Our time is taken up with that. And we're not 
capitalizing on our earning potential. There are also lots of media messages every day that tell women, stop buying lattes, don't be a shopaholic, stop buying shoes, cut coupons. Men get different, very different messages. Men get messages of become more powerful, invest, take risks, right? Women are getting the opposite messages. And, you know, historically, women only got the right to have bank accounts and credit cards and be able to take out loans without a male co-signer in the last 50 years. Years. Right. So this is still very new. It's like our mothers and our grandmothers could not have their own credit cards. So this is still new for women to have their own money, to have a lot of it, to be big financial actors in the in our society and in our economy. And I think we need to take more advantage of that and really lean into our earning potential. I feel like there should be a middle ground, though, too, because you talk about how totally men get different messaging than women do. But yeah. I also hear some of the messaging that, that young boys are getting today. And I'm like, I, I wish it were a little softer. <laughs> like some of the, the messaging I feel now for young women seems better than some of the messages that our, our young boys are getting. How so? Tell me more about that, because I'm so interested in this. I feel like there's this fake machismo that guys are supposed mm. to have this uh, beating of our chest. And if I'm not beating my <laughs> chest that there's something wrong with me. Yeah. That, that to me is really, is really frustrating. I'll tell you what was more frustrating though, back to really what you're talking about. I remember when I was a financial planner and in the late nineties, Rachel, they were trying to have me give a seminar, give seminars to women about women in investing. And the investment community was so damn condescending to women and mm. about all of these messages about what women should. And, and I felt like such a, I don't know. I was the wrong person to give the message. Number one, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I, I was just like, really, isn't we don't have one woman in the organization that could give this message. Why me? Because I think it sends the wrong signal to yes. send, the, send the middle aged white guy out to teach women how to invest. <laughs> I don't know. Dear, I totally agree with you. And I agree that like when we send these like messages that as a boy or a girl, like this is your role and this is how you should be in the world. I think it's bad for everybody involved. It's not good for boys either, right? Like in my household, I was the breadwinner for a long period of time. And my husband stayed home with the kids because he loved that. And I loved working and he hated his job, right? So he got to quit his job and be at home with the kids which he really enjoyed. And I got to do the work that I really care about. And that worked for us. But there were so many messages that you're not supposed to be doing that. And we had to work through that together because it's not what is considered typical. So I think when we have these sort of like gender norms or like these rules, it really prevents us from being able to do what we really want to do. Yeah, I totally agree. I want to talk about timing, though, too, because, as you know, coaching so many women, Rachel, that uh, last year was very difficult. And I know based on a CNBC piece that I was reading about you this morning that even in your business, you saw some struggles during COVID. When did you realize last year that things were going to be different for your clients and different for your business? Literally right away. So as soon as the pandemic was declared, I mean, it was almost like not even weeks later, people were laying people off because we went into lockdown, right? So I had so many clients reaching out to me saying that their husbands lost their jobs or that they lost big clients. And so if my clients weren't getting paid, then they weren't going to be able to pay me. Yeah. Yeah. We had to pivot during that time and really imagine, okay, what do we have, right? Take stock of the assets we have, which is something I think we should all have the ability to do. And at times we need to do, right? Even just as individuals. And so I was like, okay, I have an amazing team. I have an audience. I have an offer that maybe doesn't work in the economic climate we're in right now. So what can I do differently? You know, what can I offer to this audience? And so we reimagined what we were doing and, and found another way to offer the same business training, education and coaching, but in a different setting. So because we had a, a mastermind and we were doing consulting and working with clients in a real close way. And it was expensive because it took a ton of our time. And people got amazing results, but we were like, how can we reimagine this and package this in a way where it could be really cost effective and only a couple hundred dollars a month for people to invest in and be able to get this training and education? And so we reworked it into a membership community. And I mean, it took off immediately. Like it, it was exactly what people wanted. And I'm 
that was a benefit that happened out of this terrible experience that we've all had this last year with this horrible pandemic and COVID is it forced me to really take stock of what was going on in my business and find another way. And I love it because it allowed us to we are teaching things that are behind $100,000 paywalls, right? Where like you have to go into this really high-end expensive mastermind that includes travel and all this stuff in order to get this kind of information. And I wanted to just give it to people for 300 bucks a month, you know? (laughs) And so we found a way to do that and it was hugely successful. So, I mean, we wound up with a thousand new clients in a month and my business doubled in size last year in the middle of a pandemic, which is insane. Well, you, you had your first million dollars in revenue, according to the CNBC piece, feel free to fact check them and me if, if any of this is wrong. But, but it, must, it was actually our first million dollar month or million dollar our, month. Yeah, yeah. Yes. That's powerful. But even more than that, just your ability to help more people, you must that must feel great that because of the pivot, so many people needed help and you were able to be there for them. Exactly. You know, we used to serve like 50 clients a year and now we are serving closer to 2000 clients a year and just able to help a lot more people. And it works. The clients are getting results. They're able to grow their businesses. They're able to build their wealth. And so it's it's been amazing. And it's such a joy to lead this community. It's also challenging at times, but it's really a fun experience as well. So we're we're really happy. You speak a lot about the difference between what a lot of people do. You call them broke ass, like broke ass decisions yes. <laughs> versus million dollar thinking. And it's, and, I, and a lot of it is about mindset, but part of that mindset and something that we don't get to talk to people a lot, you focus a lot on boundaries, Rachel, uh, which is funny because most people that we talk to and interview, they talk about opportunities. And don't yes. get me wrong, it's not that you're about opportunity, not about opportunities, but boundaries play, I think, a big role in your coaching. Why is that? Why the emphasis on boundaries? Yes, because in order to capitalize on our earning potential, we have to really think about how we are spending our time, right? And it's not just about maximizing productivity. It's just about having the mental space to even come up with creative ideas, things that we can create in the world that provide value to other people that we can make money from. If we are hustling to get the kids out of the the door in the morning, working all day, coming home, hustling some more with dinner and everything else and cleaning and, and cooking and all of the things, and then get the kids in bed and we're exhausted. And then we do it all again the next day. At what point do we have time to really think about what do we want to create in the world? How can we add more value? How can we increase our earning potential? So it's important to have boundaries to create space, especially for women, because studies show that even breadwinning women, so even women who bring in the lion's share of the money into the household are still doing the vast majority of the domestic work in heterosexual relationships. We as women are doing the lion's share of the domestic labor and even the thinking about the labor, right? Even the remembering that the kids need to go to the doctor and the remembering about we need to set up the birthday party or whatever it is. Um, There is so much labor involved with children and with running a household and it usually falls on women. And so I'm challenging women and really anybody who reads this book to really be thinking about how do you want to spend your time? How can you be more intentional about it? And how can you create space in your life so that you're not saying yes to all this stuff that you don't want to be doing and you're preserving your time and your energy to focus on what really matters to you. And if building wealth matters to you, you need to have time and energy to be thinking about that. You obviously have a long background in negotiation, but, <laughs> but but the apple, Rachel, doesn't fall far from the tree. You say that your daughter is what a ninja negotiator? <laughs> yes. Yes, she is, unfortunately for me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she likes the guilt trip, which I remember. My kids are 25 now, Rachel, but I totally remember this. Guilt trip runs strong in our family, too. Yes, exactly. And especially, you know, as working mothers, I think we are very, very familiar with the guilt trip that our children gives us. And and I feel like it's learned, right? Like they're learning it in TV shows and things like that. But they they think it's their job to dictate our time and decide how we spend our time. So I have boundaries even with my children. And I explain to them that like, listen, mommy likes to work and you benefit from my work because you get to go to a great private school. You get to live in a nice home. And so you got to contribute as well. And your contribution is entertain yourself until I'm done working today. And then I'm going to give you my undivided attention. You know why? Because I'm not cooking dinner because I've outsourced it. 
And now I get to focus on you in the evening and I don't have to spend my time taking care of the household. We can spend quality time together after work. But I I make it clear with my children and have conversations about this because I want them to know that like they also get to build a life when they get older where they get to do what they want with their time. I don't want my daughter to grow up thinking that her job is to take care of everybody else and her needs are last on the list. And at work, it is similar. And by the way, I've, I've seen many studies, you've seen many more that show that women want to make sure that they get along at work. So they're going to have fewer boundaries than men have at work. And you talk about having that relationship with the boss is also essential. And, and, and you've got an analogy in the book about, uh, about the time you go home and the boss that wants you to work late every night. Exactly. Yes. One of the people that I used to work with, she used to run out of her job (laughs) like a crazy person because her boss kept her late literally every day. And she was charged a dollar a minute from after school if she was late. And she'd be driving like a crazy person and stressed out every night to go pick up her son. And I'm like, a boundary is required. You know, we think that we have to be nice all the time and we have to be accommodating to everybody. And I'm like, no, stand up for your needs and let the boss know I need to leave at this time every day. If there's an occasional emergency or something comes up or it's we've got a launch or something big going on, yes, it can happen at times, but I can't be doing this every day. It's interesting because there are studies that show that people who have boundaries at work actually wind up making more money. Mm-hmm. Isn't that interesting? We think, oh, I need to just be nice and that's what's going to lead to more opportunity. No, actually, you need to set boundaries and let people know like where your lines are and that actually leads to more money. <laughs> but, but I would think most people are afraid of the pushback they're going to get when they start enforcing a boundary. Is that what you're finding from the people you coach? I actually find that people respect people with boundaries. And there are times where, you know, you might get some pushback. And also, you know, maybe that means that this is not something that is working for you. Or, you know, you have to teach other people how to treat you. And that's not always easy. Sometimes it is challenging and there are uncomfortable conversations. But I'd rather have an uncomfortable conversation than run like a crazy person after work every day or have other frustrations in the workplace on a daily basis. Like one of the other things that happens to women all the time is like, oh, you're the women in the office. So like you need to order the birthday cake for such and such as birthday because apparently a man can't do that. Every, <laughs> by the way, I've, I haven't worked in an office in a decade, but every office I worked in, that was the way it went. Exactly. Right. And it's like, how about you do it? And I'll stay over here focused on my work. How about that? <laughs> that's, that's crazy. What are you talking about this craziness? <laughs> I just think it's really important for us as women to stand up for ourselves professionally and to enforce our boundaries. That's what enables us to increase our earning potential, right? We need to be thinking about how are we spending our time? How is our time wasted and frittered away? And how can we reclaim some of that time and use it on what matters to us instead of what matters to everybody else? You know, I'm not a woman, but I've had uh, some times where I just want to be the yes guy. I want to be the guy that's helpful, the guy that is the go-to guy. And I found that having those difficult conversations that you talk about, even for me, Rachel, most of that's in my head and not having those conversations is way worse than having them. I feel like yeah. the difficult conversation is a good thing. It isn't a bad thing. And it's not something that I should fear. And I fear it all the time, but I shouldn't fear because every time I have that conversation, it ends up being great. We know each other better. Exactly. And you build trust that way and you build respect, mutual respect with the people that you're in relationship with. I think it's a beautiful thing. It's so interesting in my law practice, you know, I'd have clients come to me and say, Hey, such and such didn't pay me. They're all small businesses. Such, you know, this customer didn't pay me. Can you go after them? And I'm like, sure, I can do that. When was the last time you requested payment from them? And they were like, I didn't. What do you mean you didn't? (laughs) You never reached out to them and said, Hey, you owe me money, your payment's late or whatever. No, they're that afraid of confrontation, you know? And I'm like, oh my God. So you want me to come in as the lawyer with a heavy hitter when you could just send an email and just collect your money? I think that would even make it worse, wouldn't it? (laughs) Exactly right. Exactly. So I think we are just so afraid to, for some reason, tell people something that they may not want to hear. But I promise you that when you practice more and more, you actually get better at it and you feel more empowered and you get 
really good at being able to clearly communicate your needs and what you want and also be willing to listen to what the other side wants, right? And it's okay if you're not all on the same page or it's okay if you disagree, but we can't always be getting the short end of the stick. So we have to be willing to communicate what it is that we need and what it is that we want. I want to ask you about your squad. You have a whole chapter about your squad. And and like you, I think it's really important that you surround yourself with good people. But throughout your book, you talk about masterminds you were in. And people can read the book to hear about some of the horror stories that you had <laughs> in masterminds. But it also seems like, Rachel, you had some great things happen there, too. Should people pay to be a mastermind or should you grab a group of friends and be in a mastermind? Tell me about paying for masterminds. Worth the money? In my opinion, yes. I feel like I got connected to communities that I never would have gotten connected to had I not paid money. Like, you know, networking is one of those things where it really depends on, did you grow up in an affluent neighborhood? Did you go to like a top university? Did you work at a Fortune 500 company? If none of those things are true, then your network is probably not as strong as it could be. And having a professional network, having a squad, a community of people that are building wealth, ambitious, going after what they want and supportive of you and you can be supportive of them, it makes a huge difference. There's actually a study that I quote in the book that talks about how your success or failure in any endeavor that you pursue is 95% of that can be determined by who you're spending time with on a daily basis. And there's multiple studies, not just one, that show that who you spend time with really affect what you can accomplish in life, right? So if you want to build wealth, if you want to become a millionaire, then hanging out with people who have a millionaire's mindset, right? Hanging out with successful people, hanging out with ambitious people, hanging out with people who are supportive of you and you, and the things that you're trying to make happen make a huge difference. So it's really important. And I think it's worth paying for. The first mastermind like community that I ever joined was by a woman named Pam Slim, who's amazing. And she actually has another book coming out soon. But she's an incredible coach and business owner. I joined that community. And I literally can count millions of dollars that have been made because I joined that community. And it cost me $2,500 for like a couple months of coaching and one live in-person thing. They're more expensive now. This was 10 years ago. But I do think it's worth every penny. That network has become friends and clients and I've gotten so many referrals. I've gotten public speaking gigs. I mean, all kinds of opportunities have poured out from the networks that I have invested in. So I do think it's worth it. It seems like this is a two-part problem, though. Number one is surrounding yourself with those right people, no matter how you find them, uh, whether it's a paid mastermind, whatever. The the other part is getting rid of those broke-ass people. And, and I guess getting rid of them isn't the right phrase, but how do you change the people? How do you tell people no? Because I feel like you don't just have this vacuum of time. There's already people in your life. And if you've got to change those people, you might hurt some feelings along the way. Yes. And I'm not saying get rid of all your old friends, you know, but I am saying, you know, if you have friends who are always discouraging you every time you talk about your dreams and and your goals and who tell you, who do you think you are? Stop spending money on this and bring you down. Then you need to maybe limit how much time you spend with that. Maybe they're not the person you talk to every day. Maybe you don't share your dreams and your entrepreneurial endeavors with them. And you find other people to share that with. And and you don't have to stop being friends with them, but just don't involve them in the things that you're building. And maybe don't be talking to them every day because that kind of discouragement really affects us and really affects our ability to stay focused and, and work on our goals. So I don't think you have to cancel people. I just think that you need to be mindful of who you're spending your time with as a general rule. And you can also, you know, for example, if you've got a best friend, maybe you invite that best friend along. Maybe you do a book club with them. Maybe you ask them to come to the next event that you join, bring them along for the journey so that they can be a part of the experience. And if they don't want to be cool, hang out with them on the weekends if you want to, but make sure that people you're talking to every day are the kinds of people that are encouraging. I have a squad of people that I'm on text message with every day. They're really close friends. I talk to them all day long. We're always voxing or sending text messages back and forth (laughs) and helping each other and networking and sharing referrals and sending opportunities each other's way and just being ultimately supportive. And I think we all continue to grow our success because we're doing that together. That's so powerful. And then I like, I I also like 
Well, I like a few things that you said that I want to make sure that everybody heard. Number one was being mindful, right, with your time, because I think often we're not. But then number two, or mindful about who you spend your time with, but then also number two, bringing your friends along with you to share in your success. And if they decide not to go, it wasn't your decision. It was their decision. Right. Exactly. And again, you know, you might have your friends that you love to go party with or your friends that you love to play golf with or your friends that you love to do whatever with. Maybe you've got, you know, your friends that have a toddler and you have a toddler and y'all do mommy things with your toddlers together and that kind of stuff, which is awesome. We need friends. And there's different friends that we hang out with in different ways. But if you're trying to pursue building wealth, having some friends that are doing that as well is important. I I just got to say, I don't like golfing with anybody. (laughs) I just, I should like it. Every time I go out there, I don't know about you, but every time I go out like the fourth or fifth hole, Rachel, I'm like, I should love this. And then I get to hole 14 and I'm like, what the hell am I still doing out here? You know, I want to try it. I have a good girlfriend who is a black woman who has told me that she loves playing golf. And I'm like, take me with you. Teach me your ways. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I feel like there are, there is networking and opportunity that happens on golf courses. And in honestly, in a lot of different places. But that's sort of like a traditional kind yeah, of yeah. networking kind of thing. And I think a lot of women are infiltrating country clubs and women of color as well. So it's interesting. Well, you can have it because I don't really want it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take your spot. Meet me, meet me at the board game table, Rachel. I'm, I'm much better there. Uh, I want to end with just one more thing, which is a lot of people that I interview want to frugal their life and cut, 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 cut to get where they want to go. You have this idea that you present called the million dollar vision, and you've got a few steps. And the first step is to mentally upgrade your everyday life. So instead of frugaling, I, I, I kind of did a double take. I got to say, I'm like, what is she saying? Spend more money. And I went, yeah, yeah she's saying spend more money. Um, mentally upgrade your everyday life instead of frugaling down. Why is that? Well, there's an actual study that shows that those who save their way to millions, it takes about 32 years to save around, you know, to save a couple million. And those folks are saving on average $3 million over a 32 year period, almost your whole career. And then those who have built businesses or are otherwise finding earning potential opportunities, whether it's through like Climbing the corporate ladder, that takes, you know, a certain period of time. But entrepreneurship in particular, if you buy a business, create a business, that kind of thing, those folks are getting to millionaire status within 12 years and they're earning $7 million. And so you earn more and faster through entrepreneurship. And so my idea is not to, first of all, saving your way to millions is totally an opportunity, but it takes a really long time. It takes a lot of sacrifice and I want to enjoy my life. Tomorrow is not promised. I am very motivated by the things that I want. So one of the things that I wanted when I was living in my tiny two bedroom house, two bedroom, one bath with, you know, three kids, one of them, a teenage girl, dear God. And (laughs) You know, my my office was shoved into the corner right next to the front door. People are knocking on the door all day, interrupting me constantly. It was just like, it was a, the tiniest, cutest house, but it was so tiny. I think it was like a total of around a thousand square feet. And I know everybody's into tiny houses. I was not. I wanted a, I wanted my dream home. I wanted a nice backyard. I wanted space for my children. And so I was like, well, let me think about how much does that actually cost? Because I just assume that I can't ever do it. But what if I could? Like, what if I just priced it out? So I went and looked, what would it cost me to get my dream home around a million dollars? Okay, what's a mortgage on a million dollar house? $5,000 a month. Okay, so how could I make another $5,000 a month so I can earn a house like that? And And then then I started thinking. All of a sudden you're in dream mode. Exactly. And all of a sudden you're expanding an impossibility and thinking about what could I do to generate another $5,000 a month instead of what could I do to save, you know, $80 a month on my cell phone bill? You know, it's like, yeah, cool. You save a couple pennies or you could focus on earning potential and in that same amount of brain space, be able to come up with ways to make a lot more money. And I think we're really highly motivated by the things that we want. Maybe you want a boat. Maybe you want to take care of your mom. Maybe, you know, it, it doesn't matter what the thing is, as long as it motivates you and it's your why, you know, maybe you want to move to a nicer neighborhood or put your kids in private school, um, whatever those opportunities look like, 
And you just price it out. How much does it actually cost for private school? How much does a full-time nanny cost? How much does it cost for this dream boat that I want, right? And you actually do the math on that. And so when I did that, I was like, okay, I need to earn $300,000 a year to have my dream life. And I'm currently making around $100,000 a year. Okay, what could I do to like 3X my income? And I just start to ask this impossible question because we think it's impossible, but let's just ask the question and start to imagine it. And then you start brainstorming and coming up with ideas. And yeah, a lot of those ideas are terrible and you're going to toss them out, but some of them might be worth trying. And some of them might be the kinds that make you that $300,000 and then some, right? And that's what happened for me. I just started to imagine it and put some numbers around it. Instead of assuming that I couldn't, I tried to find a way that I could. I did that and then I did the next thing and then I did the next thing. And then next thing you know, you're doing all these impossible things and you're a millionaire. It's so powerful and it's also so fun and it's uh, beyond just the incremental living, I think, that a lot of us do. The, the book is We Should All Be Millionaires, A Woman's Guide to Earning More, Building Wealth and Gaining Economic Power. Rachel, I'm assuming it's available everywhere, right? Absolutely. It sure is. And you can go to hello7.co slash book and get all the details on the perks we're giving away and the books where we're doing and all the places that the book is being sold right now. I, I should have mentioned that too, because you also have lots of coaching resources there as well. Absolutely. Yes. We have a podcast and we, I mean, we provide so much training for free. Um, and in fact, one of the incentives that we're offering right now is a two week intensive coaching experience where you'll get some lessons that help you to deep dive on million dollar boundaries, like we talked about and some other topics from the book. And uh, you'll get some live group coaching with me. And all you got to do is order a hardcover copy of the book before the book comes out. And then you get to join this experience. Awesome. And we'll link to it, by the way, in our show notes page at stackybedjamins.com. Rachel, this was so fun. Thank you for helping so many women in our audience. And frankly, men like me that are along for the ride, too. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. This was a blast. Hey, trivia fans, I'm your pal Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. So let's get the giant elephant in the room out of the way, just right out of the chute here. Everybody keeps asking why I'm wearing a cape today. And if you're also wondering, I'm just going to tell you, you must have forgotten that today is National Superhero Day. So citizens of Stackerville say hello to Captain Abundance. Okay, that's... Tracy, the neighbor kid with her new piccolo. Yeah, nice job, kid. Nice job. But look, next time, probably going to need like a whole horn section. Need some trombones, some sweet saxes, some killer, you know, trumpets. Just a little more oomph. Know what I mean? Oh, okay. Yeah, fine. Whatever. Back to today's script. So uh, I'm Captain Abundance. All right. There it is again. Thanks, Tracy. Uh, Here to save you from those broke ass decisions. How, might you ask? easy. Rachel Rogers says, stop fixing up that car and buy a quality pre-owned car. Well, Captain Abundance says, all right, okay, that's enough, kid. How about just don't buy a broken car to begin with? (laughs) What a showstopper, huh? Oh, boy. Nothing I love better than being Captain Abundance. All All right, okay, fine. Tracy, that's enough. Run along home. I'll share my More super tips in a moment, but before I share, let's get to today's trivia. The question is, which superhero has grossed the most in the box office ever? I'll be back with your answer faster than a speeding bullet. Tracy, come on. Well, if you're new to the show, you may not know how tough it is to bring all of these segments together, all the pieces between Doug's various pieces, the interview during today's show, the commentary with OG and I, it takes a serious, serious program to make sure that everything comes together right at the right time when we need it. And for us, we use monday.com to get where we want to go. We always say that after behavior, the most important thing is to have the right tools. Well, the same goes for work. Choosing and implementing the right work platform and practices can help you and your team get more 
done together. Monday.com Work OS is a flexible work platform where teams can run all their work together, whether it's your personal investment or your professional goals, reaching any long-term goals more attainable when you have a plan. And Monday.com Work OS is a flexible platform that helps you map out that road to success with your team. It makes collaborating easy because it's flexible. It's visual online. Uh, the color scheme is fantastic. And I know just looking at the different colors, when I look at upcoming shows, we're working on five weeks of shows at a time, about 15 shows at one time. And we are constantly tweaking our monday.com process so that it makes it easier. The second that I'm done with something and it has to go to our great engineer, Steve, or when Karen finishes with uh, a guest and has them ready to go and I need to interview them. There's a green light. It's all taken care of. It is seamless because we spent time tweaking one system. You know, if you've ever read my favorite book on business, it's called The E-Myth. They talk about the importance of having the right system. Well, Monday.com is a system that's suitable for any size from a team of five to 5,000 collaborating across the globe. It's the easiest way to keep everybody connected and on track. So there's no more lost emails. Don't have to have countless video calls, these vague action items and endless back and forth for simple projects. You know, who owns it, how it needs to be done, when it needs to be done. And when it is done, the next person in line is able to grab it and start working also. The cool thing is it works with all the tools you already have, like Slack, Dropbox, Zoom, Google Calendar, Gmail, and so much more means all your work in one tab instead of what I used to get uh, chided for, 50 tabs. So if you want your team to be more effective than ever, visit monday.com for your free two-week trial. When your teamwork is effective, nothing can stop you to start your 14-day trial. Head to monday.com. This episode is brought to you by Klarna. There's shopping, and then there's Klarna. Shopping is hard. You got to get up, go to the store, and then comes paying all at once. For instance, imagine you see the perfect leather jacket hanging in a store window. You know you shouldn't get it, but it's there, beckoning you in with its rugged coolness. With Klarna, you can shop smarter, not harder. Just fire up the Klarna app and boom, you have the power to split that one big jacket purchase into four little ones, interest-free. It's like having a personal shopper who understands budgeting. Because how you pay should make you feel as cool as that new leather jacket does. But that's not all. In the Klarna app, you can browse curated wish lists and deals that are updated daily. Save items you love and get alerts when the price drops. And earn rewards on every purchase when you join their free rewards program. You deserve to shop like a VIP without the annual fee. Get the Klarna app today. That's K-L-A-R-N-A. California resident loans made or arranged pursuant to a California finance lender's law license. Hey, trivia fans. It's your friendly neighborhood superhero, Captain Abundance. Psst. It's actually me, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. I'm back without that pesky neighbor kid to help you fight off the allure of broke-ass decisions. People say, save and invest. How about this? Just cut out the middleman of saving money and instead just score a higher rate of return. Boom! Problem solved again. Citizen, another. Oh, yeah, sure, you got it, kid. Whole life or term life insurance? That's easy. Just don't die. Pow! P -p Pow! Do I have to do everything for you, citizen of Stackerville? Lucky for you, I am Captain Abundance. I thought you went upstairs, Tracy. Get out of here. Okay, I think that's enough tips for now, kids. So, uh, so how about a healthy and nutritious helping of today's trivia? Question was, which superhero has grossed the most in the box office ever? Coming in at number three, because you know I just can't go straight to number one. I always got to give you the list and you just got to build the suspense. So anyway, coming in at number three at $11.5 it's Captain America, slacker. At number two, 
at 12.3 billion, it's Spider-Man, and at number one with 12.5 billion, it's who else but Iron Man. If you implement my abundance tips, you too will have your 12 billion before you know it. See ya. Which series have you liked better, Iron Man or Spider-Man? Uh... The problem with the Spider-Man one is that it seems like it restarted all the time. It, it does. I, I can never like figure out, you know, it's always the kid, which I get that that's the whole storyline is it's always, you know, the kid. And eventually the kid gets to be 30 and <laughs> like get a new kid. Don't think we can have Toby play that part anymore. Yeah. I'd say just Iron Man for that purpose. Tom Holland it was a good Spider-Man, but I'm with you. I'm like, okay, which Spider-Man are we on now? What are we doing? I did like, though, the Batman reboots. Like the Christian Bale ones? Yeah, the Heath Heath Ledger is the Joker. Yeah, yeah, those are pretty freaking good. Yes, just darker. Thanks to Rachel Rogers for stopping by. How about this idea, totally contrary to most people we talk to, OG, about focusing on upgrades of your life, spending more money instead of spending less. What do you think about that? That's kind of what I do. I love it. <laughs> I mean... I'm a big fan of spending money. I like it. I like spending more of it. <laughs> At the end of the day, like you can only cut so much stuff. There was a time for most people, if you, if you've got any sort of gray hair, right? If you've been if you're experienced at all, there was a time when you made half the money you make now. There might be a time where you made 10% of the money that you make right now. You know, just look at your social security earnings history, pull that statement down from the social security website. And along that journey, you know, when you made 10,000 and then you made 20, at one point in time, you went, I'd really like to make 40 and you made 40 and then you went, I'd really like to make 60 and then you made 60 and I'd really like to make a hundred and then you made a hundred. But I don't think it's always just about the money though. I mean, I get all that. I think it's also about what I'm saying is that when you look at the move to the next level, yeah, when you're going, yeah, but I could never do that. It's like, but you've already done it. You've already gone from 50 to 100. If you just look back, you've done it over and over and over again. You've done it a hundred times already. So you can also go when, when you're like, yeah, but now I make 100,000. 100, There's no way I could go make 200 and do the other extra stuff that I want to do in life. Yeah, you can. You've already doubled your income. So I don't know. I like that part. I do too. And I think it it just goes along with the way that we're wired. I think we're wired to think about how are we able to do more and maybe not even do more. Maybe it's be more, whatever more is for you. How can I have influence on my community? I loved her talking about that. What can I do to help the people around me have a better life? Like the way she helped her community during COVID and influencing more people during the past year and how that also made her a lot more money when she did it. She not only helped more people, it made her more money just by a simple pivot And I think this idea about thinking about more isn't just about money. When you get in that dreaming state of what more can I be? What more can I do? I think that sets me on fire way more than let's figure out what's the 30% of my stuff that I can cut. And don't get me wrong. You want to build a difference between the amount that you're bringing in and the amount that you're spending, right? I mean, that's where the magic happens with your net worth is in between those two. But certainly increasing that top line and then taking a part of it to make your life better today. It it really reminds me of what Bill Perkins said. Remember Bill Perkins, the poker player, talking about dying broke? And talking about how you've got these certain times in life when there's these experiences, and that time's going to go away. Like your kids are a certain age. There's experiences that you can have with your kids. A trip to Disney that is not going to be the same 10 years from now as it is today. It's going to be a totally different experience, even if you try to do it then. So if you hold off 10 years, it's not going to be, he talked about backpacking in Europe. I remember Bill Perkins saying he's 50 years old. He's like, I'm way too bougie (laughs) to, to go backpacking (laughs) through Europe. I'm staying at five-star hotels now. You kidding me? And he didn't do the backpacking and he regrets it. So I think this idea of the upgrade, just super, super exciting. It's a dream about what more we can influence. Thanks to Rachel for stopping by. Hey, let's, uh, Let's throw out Haven Lifeline, OG, and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they put what you value first. Uh, we are um, <clears throat> still on the food theme. 
uh, in the Haven Lifeline here. So uh, my son just had a birthday, so we've got leftover birthday cake, which I'm a big fan of, like, two-day-old birthday cake, actually. I like fresh birthday cake, but I do like two-day-old birthday cake. Did you see the the crap you got from last week's show about uh, frosting? No. Besides it being nasty? Besides the fact that you're wrong. Oh, okay. Sure. For once, I actually, I think I'm, I'm winning this thing in the court of popular stacker opinion. It's about time. Okay. I think it's taking vacations and get the vacation that I just booked that I get to talk about for a year after I do it. Oh you know boy. what's next? I'm headed to Jordan in Egypt. Good day, mate. Different, different place. I don't know. Slightly, slightly different. Well, it depends on what trip I'm on. If I'm on the Aussie trip to Jordan and Egypt, then we, then we got that. So hopefully a year from now that happens, but that's in the planning stage. I'm gonna go visit the Valley of the Kings. Sounds pretty cool. Yeah, should be great. It actually is spending time with your loved ones, having more time to do what you want. And that's why they keep the application super simple. It's all straightforward. They got rid of all those questions that you don't need. You get an insurance decision immediately. And of course, they're backed by a hundred and sixty year old company at Mass Mutual. Head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash haven life now, and you'll see just how easy it is to finally get your life insurance straight. And you know if you need to do that. And also it's something that we all put off. And it's time to stop. Don't put that off. Today we're throwing it out to uh anonymous. Say hello, anonymous. Hey, Joe and OG, Anonymous here. Three years ago, when I started listening to you, I was about 13,000 in the hole. And I figured, if these jokers can get it right, so can I. So today, I'm 25 years old. I've got a net worth of about nineteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. I'm quite proud of that. I've got a W-2 income and self-employment income. Here's my situation. This year, from self-employment, I was able to score a deal for $20,000. Now, that's more money than I've seen in my entire life, my entire net worth, basically. And I want to handle it well on the tax front. I'm thinking the move is to put the remainder of my contributions to a regular IRA as opposed to a Roth IRA, and then to maybe just bite the bullet with the rest of the taxes. I do have a simple IRA for my W-2 job, which I believe is similar to a 401k but I don't want to ring any alarm bells with my boss as to why I'm suddenly increasing my retirement contributions. Any help you can give me on this would be greatly appreciated, though I do promise and solemnly swear not to learn anything. Say hi to neighbor Doug for me, because I know he's running the show. See you. <laughs> nice call, Anonymous. And by the way, kick ass, OG, from being deep in the hole to a uh, nice positive net worth and uh, rolling on make it even more happen. That's, that's a super exciting time. Uh, it's really super awesome. So congratulations uh, on the tax front of the earnings. It kind of depends on what the purpose of the money's for. You know, if, you, if this is just like a one-time, one-time deal and you're like, yeah, it's just this thing fell in my lap. I made it happen. And, and I don't need the money. Don't, don't want to touch it for the next 40 years you know, then earmarking it for retirement's a good idea. If it's a business and you're like, well, I think I, uh, there's a good chance I might be doing this every year from here and out. That kind of changes kind of the perspective on, on what you might be able to do. But just answering the question straight up of like, where can I put the money? There's two things that popped in my mind. Uh, firstly, you could do a SEP IRA. So a SEP IRA is uh, basically a retirement plan for self-employed people. That's not what SEP stands for. <laughs> Self-employed people. That's what they should make it. They should be, it should just be a self-employed people. That's what it should stand for. But sadly, it stands for self-employed pension. Anyway, so SEP, you can contribute up to 25% of your net profit. So if you made $20,000 in profit in your business, that gives you about $5,000 you can do there. You can still also do an IRA contribution, but I don't think you're going to get a tax deduction for the IRA because you have a workplace plan. That's your simple so I don't think these are the droids you're looking for. Mm. <laughs> you know, I don't think that you're going to get the result that you think, but you can do the SEP also, depending on your simple contributions. This is where you're going to have to get with a CPA 
or buy the advanced version of TurboTax or whatever you're doing on your taxes to make sure that you don't over contribute to your retirement plans. But I'm thinking you're going to be fine. So you can put 25% of your profit into SEP. You could also open an individual 401k. An individual 401k allows you to contribute $19,000 to your individual 401k plus a company match of 25% of your profit. So that would give you more money than you actually even made in your business. But again, that's going to be offset by how much you'd bid in your simple. So there's a calculation that you have to, there's a maximum that you can do there. A CPA can figure this out or a really good tax program. I would do the 401k if you think this is repeatable. Like if you say, hey, I think that, you know, I'm going to be kicking on this, you know, the next couple of years and you want to put all the money in your retirement account, do that, then drop down your simple contribution just down to the match, which is usually around 3%. And you'll be able to max out pretty much both of those that way. The only other thing that I want to bring to your attention is that if you are self-employed and you had some side hustle money, make sure that you're taking adequate accounting for all of the business expenses associated with your job. So let's say that you're a designer, a freelance designer, and you have, you work for a company and you get your regular W-2 money, but then you also did some stuff on the side on 99designs. Well, remember, you've got a, you can account for your equipment, you can account for your internet, you can account for your, the costs associated with running your business to also help reduce that profit. So if you're trying to minimize taxes, saving and investing, it's one way, but another way is to also look at it from the expense side of things, make sure you're accounting for all of the business expenses as well. So a lot of, a lot of good things to chew on there, but, um, well, I don't know if they're good things. I think they're good things. You're going to have to decide whether or not they're good things to chew on, but uh, a lot of things to chew on. And, um, it's a good problem to have. What about the discussion around, it's a lot of money to him right now, but making as much of that money Roth now at his young age and not having to worry about it, the tax ever again. What about that discussion? Yeah. I don't know. Uh, especially if you have the opinion that tax rates are going to go up. So there's two sides of this. One is if you think that you're going to make more money in the future, then you must also agree that your taxes are going to go up. And secondly, do you think that tax rates themselves, the brackets are going to go up uh, for whatever reason? And a lot of people have the opinion that they're going to go up. You know, you see all the stimulus money being spent and things like eventually somebody's got to pay the piper on that. And if that's the case and you're at a low income right now, then maybe it makes sense to use use the Roth. Yeah, you're going to, you know, you don't get a tax benefit from that at all. But from now until the end of time, that tranche of money is is tax free. So, but that doesn't really help that I'm trying to minimize my taxes. No, thing. right. There's one other one other thing that I think I want to bring up, which is you work at these small companies because they have a simple at his company. He talks about his boss and he doesn't want his boss really wondering, hmm, what the heck's going on here? But I think there are some ways to disguise it. If he starts talking about, you know, the fact that he's been listening to shows like ours lately, if he does it a little bit incrementally, you know? Sure. And I realize that his boss legally isn't allowed to have any bias around that stuff, but people are human and happens all the time. So I think he can be careful, but he can still raise that contribution level if he wants to. I I just don't want him not putting more money away because he's worried what others are going to think. Yeah. Yeah. I caught that too. And I think what you're saying is exactly right. If you start beating the drum of like, yeah, I'm going to really kind of buckle down. I, I, I read that I can put twelve and a half thousand dollars in this simple IRA every year. I just need to figure out a way to, to make that happen. You know, I'm going to really work on that. And if you, like you said, if you kind of hide that of like, I'm going to, I'm going to really stop going out to eat and I'm going to really buckle down and, you know, depending on your job, right? If you, if you're making $12,000 a year and then you're trying to put 12,000 a year away, that's going to probably right. raise some suspicions, <laughs> right? You know, like, wait a second, where are you, how are you paying rent? But, um, I'm moving to a tent. If you can, like you said, do it over time or slowly increase it. Don't, don't worry about it. Let him think whatever he wants to think. You know, if the boss calls you in and says, dude, I think you're moonlighting on me because I did the math and there's no way you're living on this. I would spin that around and go, well, I'm trying to be really smart with money, you know, and I'm trying to save and invest and, you know, kind of live well below my le- my means. So obviously you're noticing that. But if you think that uh, if you don't think you're paying me enough, I'm happy to take a pay raise. You know, if you're concerned about my well-being, 
I'd be more than happy to entertain a pay raise. Hey, oh. And let him go, oh, well, uh, 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 look, look at the Look side. at the time. Maybe, busy, maybe, busy, busy. <laughs> maybe I'll stay out of your business. Yeah. <laughs> a little yeah. bit. Anonymous did something else right. He also left his email address, which is important because Gertrude needs that, to send him the Stacking Benjamins Haven Life Greatest Money Show on Earth t-shirt, one of my favorites in the collection. StackingBenjamins.com forward slash voicemail if uh, you've got a question for OG and I. Man, that's going to do it for today. We've got uh, so many people to thank, and Doug's going to do most of that heavy lifting, but most of all, Got to thank you, especially if you're someone that told a friend about the Stacky Benjamin show, or you're someone that went out and used like Anonymous did the stuff that we talk about here to get ahead. It's so powerful to hear that people can actually have a good time talking about money and also increase their net worth at the same time. Love it. And when it comes to reviews, of the show. Big thanks to people who have done that wherever they're listening to the podcast. This one is five stars from Rubber Toe. Mom went back and uh, put back on the refrigerator because she liked it so much. I love the show. Joe and OG, very informative, entertaining. Thanks for the shout out, your friend, Roberto. It's so good. Thank you for that review. If you want to talk about stuff in the show, feel free to email me. Joe at stackingbenjamins.com. I love talking about show topics that we presented here. You also can join our Facebook group, the basement stackingbenjamins.com forward slash basement gives you the link to that. Get a guide to the show stackingbenjamins.com forward slash stacker. Follow us on social media. We don't just drone on and on and on. Listen to my podcast, listen to my podcast, listen to my podcast. We're talking building better money habits even there as well, whether it's on Twitter, on Instagram, and frankly, outside of the Facebook group, those are our two biggest channels, or our fledgling YouTube channels if you want to watch some of the interviews from past shows, most notably our interview with uh, Mark Randolph, the co-creator of Netflix, is one of those interviews, interview with Julie Satow and the Plaza Hotel the history of the Plaza Hotel. That was a a fun video. Many more at our Stacking Benjamins YouTube page. Last, if you're really here, we talked about coaching with Rachel Rogers earlier. If you feel like you need a better team in your corner to get where you want to go with your money, head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash OG. And that's the link to interface with his team to see if He and his team in your corner is the fit that will help you make better money decisions in 2021 and beyond. All right. That's going to do it for today. Doug, what should we have learned today? So what should we have learned today? First, take a lesson from our headline and plan your upcoming travel stack. Prices look to be climbing. So make sure you ask about COVID restrictions and refund policies. So you aren't out a lot of money if you end up not going. Second, want to be a millionaire? It's about who you surround yourself with and how you view the world. Don't think you can make a hundred bucks? Focus on a bigger number, not smaller. Upgrades will help you go after bigger goals and achieve larger results. But the big lesson? So it it turns out fighting crime would be way cooler if I had a super suit. Since I was gracious enough to hand you some money tips to any of you have like, you know, maybe like a spare superhero suit just sitting in the back of your closet that I could borrow so I can be Captain Abundance. Tracy, Tracy, you got to have something better to do. Come on, kid. Homework? Maybe watching a cartoon? Something. Hey, do you know what happened when Iron Man teamed up with the Silver Surfer? They became alloys. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Oh, hey, where do most superheroes live? Cape Town, duh. What happens when Batman's late to play baseball with Robin? There's a Wayne delay. Oh, that was a little more sophisticated, probably uh, over some of your heads. Uh, um, here's one. Why was young Superman the only kid on the playground? Because the sign said supervision required. <laughs> oh, 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 uh, what does Peter Parker do for a living? 
He tells people he's a web designer. Uh, here you go. Uh, what do you call Iron Man without his suit? Stark naked. Hey, what? what it, wait a minute. Whoa, wait. Where's everybody going? I got more. I got tons more. Come on back. To learn more about our guests and for more resources, you can head to our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. To learn the simple decisions you can make to become a millionaire, check out Rachel Rogers' new book, We Should All Be Millionaires, A Woman's Guide to Earning More, Building Wealth, and Gaining Economic Power. Want to get a guide to the show featuring additional commentary and resources about the topics we cover and related resources? You'll find that and more at The Stacker, our email letter. Sign up at stackingbenjamins.com forward slash stacker. This show is created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Taylor Stevens, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at SBenjaminsCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I really thought doing these credits completely naked would have been a lot more fun than it actually was. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remunerations. That's a big word. There's no way you take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. And before making any financial decisions, consult with a real financial advisor. Big backlog of reviews. I love the emails I got, by the way, about the sound of metal from everybody who's watched it. Either they watched it before I talked about it on Monday or after. I've been watching so much good stuff lately. And uh, well, let's just get into it. Today, I want to switch from movies, which was our topic on Monday, to TV shows. I've been watching this little show. About this, I don't know if you've heard of the Marvel Universe. Don't know if you're familiar with that. But this is the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. The legacy of that shield is complicated. Something to get behind. They need the symbol. So what's our plan? So no plan. Right. And as the Falcon jumps off the plane, refuses to talk about what the plan is, that was uh, Bucky the Winter Soldier. So uh, for those of you that have been following along a little bit, Captain America is gone. Steve Rogers is done. The shield got returned to the Falcon. Anthony Mackey. They think that he should have been the new Captain America taken over the legacy. It is not something he wants to do. So he donates it to a museum. This is all in the first episode, by the way. And then 
as often happens, they decide they being whoever the powers that be are to create a new Captain America. And uh, White Russell plays the new Captain America. He's the son of Kurt Russell and plays this guy who is a war hero, has been in lots of tricky situations and now has the shield and the Captain America suit. What I like about the way that this is released, like the Mandalorian, is it goes back to my childhood, OG, when I used to wait, just wait for the next show to come out. So instead of releasing them all at once and I binge them five in a row, I only get to watch one. And then I, then I wait. They also did this with the boys. They did this with the Mandalorian. They're doing it with a couple other series that I like. And, and I, I, I love that part of me hates it because I just want to binge them all. But the other part of me thinks it's so fun for Cheryl and I, oh, it's the weekend. That means the new Falcon, and the winter soldiers coming out. Fantastic. Some fun stuff to do. Some, uh, some wait for it. Television, very good series. Lots of people involved. Lots of different Marvel characters that are involved. I also like a series where the quote bad guy isn't necessarily all bad. You're not sure why people are fighting each other. Well, you know why they are. You can see why they are, but you really can see the different points of view. Almost like in the Jack Ryan series where you can see the terrorist in the first season of Jack Ryan and how he kind of came to be. And even though he's quote the bad guy, you see how he got there. You know, you, you get his motivation. Rotten tomato scores at 89 looking at it right now. I, I, I'd agree with that. So a thumb up some fun TV. If you're behind you, you can binge right now in the season on Disney plus. And I know you're going to watch it because things explode. <laughs> My kids watch it. They love it. And that whole trailer, all you, all you can hear is the music and you already know, I, you don't even need to see that trailer. All it is. Action sequence after action sequence after action sequence. Stuff blowing up, people shooting, people running. Maybe I'll try to get caught up with the boys. Maybe I'll do that. It's good from the very beginning. 